St. Louis. <laughs> okay, so it is 11.30. Um, so this week we have two of our local postdocs um, continuing our tradition. I don't know if this is a tradition before, but it's for sure a tradition now. It's, you know, whatever, a and traditions. Uh, of having at least one slot set aside for local postdocs every semester. Um, and so basically this semester and next semester, I'm going to force all of our new people to do talks. Uh, yeah, well, new-ish. You didn't do one of these when you got first got here, right? So yeah, so this still counts. Um, yeah, so today we have Kate Pitchford and Grace Olivier uh, to give us talks. So Kate requested to introduce herself, so I guess I won't. <laughs> so go ahead and dig it away. I'm not gonna do much of an introduction beyond my name is Kate. I uh, graduated from Virginia Tech a year ago now, and I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, I tend to get a shaky voice and shaking hands, so if that happens, please ignore it and just be glad that I am not a surgeon. <laughs> I'd be expecting, because of the fact that I work with now, that I'm going to have a lot of pictures of low redshift galaxy. That's not what this means. Instead, I'm going to talk about a seemingly never-ending project that I started during my PhD that is a high redshift quasar system about 2 billion years after the Big Bang. So just to include some of the local universe, everyone's seen the n sigma relation before. Basically, we know that stars and black holes seem to, be, seem to build their mass together. But if you remember back to Janelle's colloquium, the set of galaxies for which we actually have dynamical black hole mass measurements right now are not uh, fully representative of the local galaxy population. And so we might be extremely biased in this relation to where we're not entirely sure of what the intrinsic scatter is. The shape might be a little off. And whatnot. So while there seems to be a very clear correlation in the local universe, even that is potentially a topic of debate. So if we don't know what's going on in the low redshift universe, we certainly don't know what's going on in the higher redshift universe. Uh, again, we know that instead of looking at stellar mass and black hole mass uh, individually, if we look at the growth of the two, so um, AGN activity and star formation rates, um, we see that they kind of coexist across all redshifts. So what we see here on the left is your AGN luminosity density. And on the right is star formation rate density, both as a function of redshift. The only thing really to take away from this is that they have similar shapes. Um, they peak, they both peak around about a redshift of two. And so there seems to be or a significant amount of all galaxy assembly took place in the high redshift universe. Um, in fact, if you look at present stars, I believe it's something like 50% of the total stellar mass uh, was created between redshifts about one and three. So even though we don't know exactly what's going on, there does seem to be some connection between the two, but we don't know exactly what triggers star formation rate or aging activity. We don't know the uh, other end of the life cycle. We don't know what quenches the two. So there's really quite a lot that's still a matter of debate in the high redshift universe. I will mention just one uh, potential trigger mechanism and that comes in the form of major mergers. So this even predates me, but the general idea is um, in this major merger, you have an ultra luminous infrared galaxy. So the infrared luminosity is something above about 10 to the 12 times the solar luminosity. Um, within that ultra luminous galaxy, you generally, or you occasionally will have a dusty AGN component uh, as well as the starburst that provides the uh, far infrared emission. So you have a dusty AGN and starburst and or as the galaxies are beginning to merge. Um, some process tends to get rid of the dust surrounding that AGN, so you're left with uh, what are unobscured quasars. And that is what I focused on mainly over the course of my PhD was the optical quasar regime, which is the unobscured guys. Um, at some point, that AGN will turn off, and then ultimately you would be left with a quiescent galaxy. And so there are other things that could play important roles in triggering star formation and AGN. This is the one that I'm gonna focus on, the idea of major mergers, so just keep those in mind. So my PhD was more generally just studying the AGN star formation uh, connection, but the project that I'm gonna be focusing on does uh, major mergers potentially come into play there. So the object that I'm gonna be focusing on was actually first studied all the way back in 2009. Um, I'm going to call it J1607 if you want the full SDS name. SDSS name, there you go. Uh, it's a quasar at a redshift of 3.65. So, what you see here is just uh, the initial attempts to fit the spectral energy distribution from 2009. So, the two different sets of lines are two different SED fitting techniques, but they gave comparable results. So, this is just to show that you have a pretty bright agent for these dashed, dashed lines, and then the dotted lines are the starburst component. Uh, 
because things were not great in 2009 in terms of the fitting techniques, uh, things weren't fully constrained. The AGN and Starburst components were roughly comparable at about 10 to the 14 times solar. Uh, the star formation rate between the two fits, uh, one was around 3,000, the other around 8,000. So again, you're not fully constraining what's going on with the star formation rate there, but it seems like it is a very star forming uh, galaxy that's hosting this AGN. This was not the main point of this paper. What this paper wanted to do was to take a system in which you had a luminous AGN as well as a luminous starburst and look at the submillimeter emission to see what was going on with the dust. So that was actually the main point of this paper was to introduce what were at the time new submillimeter array observations. So this is showing the um, 850 micron contours overlaid on the optical image from Sloan. And generally speaking, in your submillimeter luminous AGN, you would expect the two to align. So you that dust uh, is indicative of star formation, which you expect would expect to be in the quasar host potentially. And then obviously your optical is your quasar emission. So the fact that these are offset is a bit odd to begin with. Um, the offset in the peak is roughly, it says it's signed out on the computer. Is it still? Come on, Zoom, still see? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So lost my train of thought. The, the peak of the submillimeter emission is about one and a half arc seconds to the northwest or 10 kiloarc uh, at this redshift. And so there is enough of an offset that there seems to be something else going on here. Naturally, when something odd happens, you have to try to explain what exactly is going on. And so the most uh, plausible reason for this offset in the submillimeter emission is that it's actually two separate galaxies that are merging together. So this is, would just be an early stage of a merger in which a gas-rich gas galaxy um, is merging with the gas-poor AGN host. And I didn't mention, I think it was back here, um, the full long title of what the submillimeter emission was, was an offset submillimeter emission region of star formation. That's too many words. We call it the blob. <laughs> they made the mistake of calling it the blob at one point in that paper, and so we've just stuck with that because it makes it easier. So basically, this system has three parts, if you will, the quasar, its host, and this blob. So if I refer to the blob, it's just the offset of uh, some of the emission. And so um, in this scenario, if these two galaxies are merging, the merger then triggers star formation in the gas-rich system or the blob, and the aging activity that we see in the quasar. So. That's it for the 2009 paper. We decided to follow things up um, with wide field camera three, the IR channel uh, on board HST. And so we have two orbits of two filters. Um, each orbit has a four, has four dithers. So just slight offsets um, to, if there's anything that's going on in the field, it should in theory not be on your object in each of the four dithers. So it's just to make it better, to get a better sampling and have a better idea of what's going on in your system. So this is just an image from one of the dithers for one of the orbits. Um, the thing we're noting is it doesn't really look like much. It looks, there are potentially some companions. I'm not gonna talk too much about those, but it's more or less a point source with these diffraction spikes, which are what's going to be important for what we do later. But at first glance, it doesn't look like there's much going on here beyond a typical point source. However, if you adjust your scaling a little bit, you see something going on. So. I know generally speaking, north of east, north. that's not what this is because I haven't switched it yet. So this is actually to the northwest. It is at the same position as the submillimeter blob. And so this is basically just um, IR confirmation of that blob's existence. Um, so it does actually seem to be there. The peak being offset seems to be something legitimate. And so we see, as it says here, we see clearly the blob to the northwest. So. We know we have these three components of the system and we wanna to try to as best as we can describe them all separately. So we need to basically remove the quasar from the image in order to look at the underlying host and compare that to the blob. That is where the main point of this comes into play. It ends up being very difficult. So we have to subtract the point spread function, which of course um, estimates what the quasar is doing to then look at the host underneath. Unfortunately for me, I learned the hard way in grad school that one, PSF subtraction at these high redshifts, not common. Two, even if people do PSF subtraction in the higher redshift universe, they kind of gloss over the details and they say, we made a PSF, we subtracted it, here you go. And that's all they ever explain about it, which is not helpful. But 
people end up creating uh, synthetic PSFs in a program called Tiny Tim. The issue with that ends up being that because it is a synthetic PSF, it doesn't do a good job of reproducing the imaging artifacts, i.e. those diffraction spikes that I was talking about earlier. We wanted to see if we could uh, build an empirical PSF from our field, just because if you have observations taken at the same time as the observations of your objects, they should be better able to reproduce those imaging artifacts. So we got lucky in that this is our object. There is a star nearby, so we probably don't have to worry about any spatial variations because it does change across the field in terms of PSF. And so we wanted to compare the method that people will typically use, i.e. the synthetic, with something that should be better, which in this case is our empirical PSF. The empirical PSF subtraction ends up being quite a pain to do. Um, so I guess one pro for the synthetic is it's pretty quick and easy, and you don't lose too much speed over it. So we created the empirical PSF. We did one per orbit because we ended up using the dithers to help better pinpoint the bright central pixel. So we end up with four of these, two for each orbit. Uh, we use an oversampling of four. And what that means is that for each pixel, it's split into a subset or a subgrade of four by four pixels for each of those 16 then takes on a value that is a 16th of your initial native pixel value. So it's, you can input all the parameters you want to. We started it in the native scale with a 50 by 50 pixel PSF. So in the oversampled, it's roughly 200 by 200. And so the basic method for taking the PSF that we have and getting our subtracted images is we actually oversample the full field. So the with three IR fields are 1014 by 1014 pixels. So you're up to 4056 by 4056. We then take uh, cutouts that are the same size as the PSF, and we allow those to move around where we think the central pixel of the quasar is in that oversampled regime. And then you would you would determine the best alignment based on basically where the diffraction spikes look like they are best subtracted. We do try to use residuals for the diffraction spikes because in an ideal world, they would be fully out of the picture by the time you do the subtraction. That proves difficult because when they are misaligned, you obviously have a very bright diffraction spike, a very over subtracted region. The residuals alone don't necessarily help you because those could cancel out to zero and Maybe you think that maybe you have an okay subtraction when in reality it's not at all aligned. So we do a visual inspection along with looking at the diffraction spike residuals to try and determine what that best alignment is. And we use the diffraction spikes because we don't want to assume anything of the quasar host. So we try to ignore the central region as much as possible and just focus on those outer diffraction spikes. And then once you have your idea of the best alignment, um, you subtract the two for each of your uh, dithers and then you can combine them to get a final image for each orbit. Uh, in theory, you can also get an image for each filter. So we have uh, 110 and 160. So you can, initially we're not able to do that because there were some issues in the header, but at this point things have been updated so that we can do that. I'm instead though going to show some results because they're fully completed or they were that my things have since changed in my code coding process and it's a lot. But what we see here is, so you have your unsubtracted images over here. So you can see clearly where your diffraction spikes fall. We were a bit unlucky in how things were designed and that this diffraction spike cuts through the blob in both uh, bands, but we can't really do much about that. And these are comparatively speaking much less bright. And so it probably doesn't change the flux of the blob too drastically, but it is something to note that when you're subtracting more than you want to just but so it's unsubtracted, empirical subtraction, synthetic subtraction. And so you can see, going back over here now, can't really make it out, but there is a box here that just defines the size of the, uh, the synthetic PSF. And so you can kind of tell, maybe not so much, that the diffraction spikes are still clearly there. So it's not a very good subtraction of those diffraction spikes. And if you're not doing a good job of subtracting these, can't really guarantee that you're doing a decent job of subtracting anything in the middle either. So we uh, tend to think of the synthetic subtractions as upper limits, um, but we do, for all the fit that I'm going to talk about from here on out, use the uh, empirical subtractions. And I will say the values are changing, but the remaining, the residual flux, flux in the center for the synthetic subtractions are about twice um, what they are for the empirical. So you have a lot less a lot left over, and these that isn't necessarily actually there. 
are not necessarily attributed to the host galaxy. So basically, empirical does seem to be better. Synthetic, even if you reach out to STSCI, they will say, don't use the synthetic. It's us, they're bad, you won't be able to do anything. But everyone does it because it's easy. <laughs> so moving forward with the empirical PSF subtractions. Uh, we initially wanted to, we had hoped that we would be able to separate out the galaxies in different levels. That proves to be quite difficult. So this is actually just recreating more or less Dave's 2009 SED. So it's everything that we have for the entire system. So we see it's a pretty massive galaxy. The star formation rate, though still high, is nowhere near the three to 8,000 from that 2009 paper, but it is still pretty rapidly star forming. And yeah, it's a, mass, a fairly massive galaxy. I said that we can't really say too much about the individual galaxies. We tried. Um, so for, uh, I should say first, for the host, we only really have our two HST points because we can't differentiate between the blob and the host. And in scenarios where we can pull out the blob, there doesn't seem to be anything left. Because those were you know, the optical wavelengths where you're going to dominate them. So, the blob, though, um, we have our, H our two HST points. We also have HSC images. So these guys down here are from HSC. And then we have two follow up uh, some millimeter array points at, I believe they're at 250 and 400 gigahertz. So the order is like 800 and 1300 uh, micron. So because the peak of the uh, flux in the sub millimeter is on the blob side, we do attribute that flux solely to the blob. Um, we might need to revisit that, but for the time being, uh, all of our SMA points, we're saying all the flux in the SMA will be attributed to the blob in order to be able to run this fit in the first place. So the best fit value is something like three times 10 to the 10 solar masses, uh, but we think the best we can do really is an upper limit, so somewhere around seven times 10 to 10. And the star formation rate uh, around 130 solar masses per year. Since we know that there are only the three components, if you want a very rough estimate of what's going on in the host, you could take the difference. And the total is host quasar, quasar host blob. We know what the quasar is doing. We have an estimate for what the blob is doing. So that leaves the host. So it would put you somewhere around 14, 1500 solar masses per year in terms of a star formation rate. So also uh, one of the output things from Segal is the EGN luminosity, which we can convert into a black hole mass. Obviously not nearly as robust as what Janelle's <laughs> group would be doing, but it's the best we can do with what we have. Um, so we have an AGM luminosity of nearly 10 to the 14 uh, solar luminosities. So comparable to what uh, Dave's SED was in 2009. If you just convert that using a redshift dependent Eddington ratio and then convert it to a black hole mass from Eddington luminosity, you get something that's around 10 to the 9.8 solar masses. Um, we did try an alternative SED fitting technique that I used uh, on a previous project. The issue with that one is that it doesn't give any sort of estimates of error. So we can just give the value and that gives roughly the same AG and luminosity, which would then give you the same black hole mass. Additionally, we took our estimates based on the PSF of what the quasar flux would be and fit that to a type one template. The values there were slightly lower, but I think the mass was somewhere around 10 to the 9.67, so well within any errors that you would have on that measurement. And then lastly, I don't at all believe the uncertainty on the real mass estimate, but at the very least, the best fit value is well within what we're looking at uh, using the AG and luminosity from our SED fits. So even if uh, using the scale fits for the total system is not the best way to go about doing it, it is at least comparable with various different techniques, even though I guess most of them are still SED fitting. So what does that tell us about this system? I haven't mentioned the star formation rate mean sequence, but uh, if you were to look at it around a redshift of four, both of these galaxies based on their uh, rates and stellar masses are roughly consistent with what we would think the main sequence will be. In high redshift, it's kind of hard to constrain the main sequence in the first place, but they are at least comparable to, or it seems like they're probably main sequence galaxies that are merging. Uh, just based on merger time scales, that could mean that the system evolves in a quiescent galaxy by about a redshift of two, which implies that hierarchical evolution could play a role in forming such galaxies. Also, I don't have a point that shows where this system evolved, so it would be on the upper end. 
but still roughly comparable to local ellipticals, which could further uh, imply some sort of merger-driven merger formation at redshifts of above three for at least some local ellipticals at redshifts below about 0.2. Again, we can't really say too much about that beyond that, just because things are so hard to constrain at these higher redshifts. Did go through this a little bit quicker, but in general, just older submillimeter observations indicated uh, the presence of an offset region of star formation. The updated SMA observations, the tail is not as long, but the peak of the emission is in the same place. So even the newer submillimeter uh, Data seem to show the same thing where there is an offset in the peak. Uh, we followed that up with, with three and found it basically. And so it does seem to be there. It doesn't just seem to be some issue with aligning and views and whatnot. Um, a nearby star allows us to compare two different uh, PSF creation techniques and then the results of subtractions based on those. The synthetic is not great. People use it all the time. They probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. Uh, but that would be a and then lastly, the, um, the system J1607 in and of itself is consistent with being a merger. Uh, I didn't mention this specifically, but there have been other fits with the block where we can constrain the redshift to be the redshift of the quasar and it's still consistent with being at the same redshift. So we think based on close proximity and the fact that they are consistent with the same redshifts that they are probably merging, just, and we don't have any gas dynamics or anything to be able to say specifically that they are. And so mergers could play an important role in uh, galaxy assembly in the high redshift universe. With that, I'll take any questions. Also, Casey has his hand up. Okay, here we go. Continue your surprise. Yes. Casey, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you, Kate. So, were you calling on me? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. No, it's great. Um, I, you know, it's really impressive. The, I had a couple of questions. So one, the original 2009 estimate of the star formation rate must have just been based off of the infrared luminosity at some level. And so the, the is, am I right in interpreting your newer work as saying, if you decompose that into emission from the AGN, you have a better handle on that. Then the remaining can be attributed to star formation more like 1500 solar masses a year with some uncertainty. Is that a good way to think about that? So Dave's <clears throat> SAP still breaks it down into an AGN and a starburst component. So he takes the luminosity of this, or what I understand is that he takes the luminosity of the starburst component and converts that. Um, so in theory, it should be the same. I think it's just a matter of better data coming out because, for example, his initial 50 micron SMA uh, data point is much higher than the corresponding 800 observations. And so I think it's just that the data in and of itself that he was fitting was not what was given. Okay, so it's higher. Got it. It was more the data really brought the what uh, yeah, numbers so. down. Okay, yeah. Okay. And then I was picking up on your point about the relation on the black hole stellar mass relation from Rhine's um, and Volunteri. Yeah, Volunteri, excuse me. Is it your, I was trying to figure out where your points would fall, and I think they're above the relation, right? Like up there above near the. The, the errors are, I think they're like somewhere. So they are above the relation, but also you have to account for errors and things to where they are higher, but things still are not perfect. And I hesitate to say that they are much higher just because I do have to rerun Segal with the updated stuff. So it might be that things have changed enough that brings it a bit more in line, but yes, you are correct in that at the moment, it is slightly higher, but it's not like it's all the way off of Yeah, and I agree with you, you probably have some ways out, like even if they do come out to be, you know, I think you were saying the black hole mass is like 10 to the nine and a half, and the stellar mass is like 10 to the 11 or so. Yeah, it's with, 10 to the 9.8 and 10 to the 11 Okay, so yes, yeah, so I guess like you're saying, like with minor merging or something, you could, even if, assuming those measurements are correct, all systematics aside, then minor merging or something could move you toward the local relation, but you would need something to move you that direction, or Janelle will be hunting the black holes and those things present or something, right? Okay, that's all. That was great. Questions for Kate?
so my question, I guess, is kind of like about the SED fitting in the companion. Um, I was surprised by how bright it was in the HST because this is like right before. So you're seeing really like UV emission from the bubble of the blob. It's not real, not bright relative to everything else, but yes, it is very clearly HST. Yeah. Three microns is 25 ish for the host. Do you have a sense for like whether the extinction that you get out of the images? Okay. I guess the options are right. Like either it's like bluish continuum, so you're like your UV is peeking out, and then there's the dust completely separate from it, or or the dust is actually obscuring the UV. It's look very red. Yeah, that's probably something we need to look more into because we haven't really done too much with stuff, but yeah. There could be something else going on there. Yeah, what we've actually looked at at this point. Can I ask Justin a question? I guess I would have been surprised if it wasn't detected in the HST data. That would have probably been a more interesting result, right? I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't know either. I think it's reasonably deep compared to most fields. So. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that was the discovery image SDSS. So I wasn't, and that's all yes. optical. So I wasn't particularly. You know, worried that it did with that the some millimeter was sort of off to by itself. Um, but I think, Kate, did you say you had a two orbits of HST? Yeah, IR so I'm only showing 110. We do have 160 as well. Okay, but that's you know comparable to what like candles imaging has. Yeah, so it would have surprised me more if it wasn't detected, right? And so the geometry, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. I'm just saying, yeah, right. It's an interesting system, regardless. So, but yeah, you have a really good question about what is the what is the dust attenuate like? What is A V for this thing? Right, that would be kind of interesting. Second speaker is our one of our new postdocs. There's Logay. Do you want me to introduce you, or do you want to introduce yourself? I, mean, I don't care. I can do it. Get my Zoom. I'll also say we're going to go to lunch after. Uh, we're going to take hold out for lunch, and we have like a couple slots left. Anybody wants to go lunch? Just to join. Just talk to me after. It appears that Zoom is working. Okay. Um, my presenter. It's cool. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I am Grace Olivier. I am, yeah, now a first year postdoc, I guess. This is weird. This is the first time I've done this introduction. Um, so I just graduated from The Ohio State University in like August, technically. Um, so defended my thesis July 1st, and now I'm here. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the exploring the production of high energy uh, photons with reionization era analog galaxies. Um, so this is work that I've done with Danielle Berg and John Chisholm, who are at UT Austin, as well as a number of people at Ohio State uh, and even University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Um, but I would like to say that this is really only half of the work that I did in my thesis. If you ever had uh, the desire to talk about how stars blow out the gas from their natal birth clouds, please come talk to me. Um, so I spent like four years trying to make this one plot. Um, <laughs> this <video. laughs> um, but this is uh, the other half of my thesis is really figuring out um, how the physics works in baby H2 regions and what's important to drive H2 region dynamics. Um, but that's like the other half and we're not really gonna talk about that today, but it's got pretty pictures. So I like to show them. Uh, this talk is more about uh, ethic of reionization in analog galaxies. So we're going to start with this basic overview of uh, reionization and that the universe went from having the gas between galaxies as neutral gas into this ionized gas that we see it as today. So you can actually see through the universe, which is really nice. Um, but the way that that happened is still a question. Um, the sources are generally going to be galaxies or AGN that produce the photons that can ionize that gas if you manage to 
escape from your galaxy. Um, and so you get different kind of patterns of the neutral gas as it's being ionized, depending on which source you use. Whether that's star forming galaxies at earlier or late times, you get these little smaller gaps in the neutral gas. Or if it's an AGN, then you start to get these larger bubbles that are blown in that neutral gas. But if you want to look at galaxies, the way before James Webb started discovering all of the very high redshift things that have come out, uh, which is generally how I focused this talk, because that's been recent, um, you actually just had to look for higher redshift things as dropouts or lenses uh, that you could look for in, in deep observations. And so this, these galaxies that we found through these different methods of looking for high redshift galaxies, they have told us a couple of interesting things. If you take a spectrum of those galaxies, you find that they have some extreme emission lines. Um, and by that, I mean, if you were to try and fit this galaxy with a star forming uh, template uh, of emission lines, you find that most of the emission lines fit very well. But then there's things like helium too, which you can see here. The red is the template, the black is the emission line that we observed. And that does not fit at all. Uh, where is this extra helium-2 emission coming from? Why is it booming in this high energy line? So what we want to do is use those emission lines from high redshift galaxies or analogs to high redshift galaxies and tr actually trace what the ionizing spectrum that lives in, like from, of the stars in those galaxies, what that would look like. You can do that pretty well using emission lines. So, uh, Things like helium-2, they are giving you emission if you have photons that are greater than 54 eV. That is a high energy photon to come from a stellar population. Um, so that's generally one of the problem lines that we see if we're trying to find extreme emission line galaxies. We're looking for helium-2 or carbon-4 or neon-5 and other things. <laughs> um, we're looking for these high energy very high ionization lines. Um, but you can use all of the emission lines in order to trace the ionizing spectrum. So you know that if you have oxygen three versus uh, N2, if you use all of these other lower energy lines, you can trace out what that spectrum shape should look like. And the question that we wanted to answer with the project that we were, were doing here was if you use the emission lines that you get out of these extreme emission line galaxies, BELGs. And you also had a way to just directly measure what those stellar populations were. Would those stars that we saw in these galaxies recreate the emission lines that we observed? Because maybe the stars do actually create the helium too. It seems weird because those are high energy photons, but that was the, the goal, checking whether or not the stars and the emission lines were matched. So to do that, we used two analog galaxies in the local we used J104457 and J141851, which I will shorten to J10 and J14 because I only have two. Um, and we used these two galaxies because they have the largest carbon-4 equivalent width and the largest helium-2 equivalent width that we've measured in the local universe. And so we got a uh, cost spectra of these so that we could have uh, rest frame UV. That is what we wanted to work off of because a lot of the galaxies at higher redshift, when we have James Webb spectra, we're going to be seeing a lot of rest frame UV emission lines. Um, when we do these two galaxies, um, we see these gorgeous extreme emission lines um, out of tiny little, essentially one H2 region galaxies that you can see in the, um, the cost spectra of cost imaging here. But the thing about analog galaxies is that they're nearby. So these two are Z of 0.001-ish. They're like really very close. Um, and so you can actually use optical spectrum from the ground in order to, to trace out the rest of those emission lines. So if you have this whole suite of emission lines from optical and UV, you might be able to get a better understanding of what is happening. So we used LBT um, and we used the mod spectrograph in order to get these uh, additional optical spectra. So what we wanted to do was check whether or not the stars in those galaxies um, actually match the emission lines. 
So we need to do stellar continuum fitting to find out what the stars are. To do that, we took the continuum of the UV um, spectrum that we had just obtained, and we used that to fit the stellar populations by masking out all of the emission lines and just looking for these absorption features that you see as like iron five absorption um, that is coming from the photospheres of the stars. So if you do that, fit the stellar population, you find that these are very young metal poor galaxies. Um, so if you use BPASS for binary stars, the age of this galaxy is maybe four mega years. Um, and the single stars wanted to say it was one mega year. So um, they're young, <laughs> they're metal poor, um, they're less than 15% solar. Um, so this is probably actually a good uh, candidate for being similar to some of those early galaxies we're seeing out of James Webb. For day 14, things got a little bit older. Uh, the single stars thought it was 11 mega years old. So, so old here, uh, but it's again, less than 10% solar. So these are very, very young metal core galaxies. Um, why don't we look at what that stellar population would look like on an actual, like for the ionizing continuum. Uh, you see that the space to the left of those helium-2 and carbon-4 dashed lines, that is where you want flux in order to produce helium-2 or carbon-4. But there's very little flux for carbon-4, and there's essentially nothing for helium-2. So it doesn't look like the stars will be able to produce this, but we wanted to make sure that this is true. So we went to the standard way, standard way, you would look at um, what emission lines a stellar population would produce. And that is photoionization modeling. So these are line ratios of different emission lines that trace different parts of the ionizing spectrum. And what we did is we used Cloudy to model what the emission lines out of different stellar populations would look like. We started with this level one version, which is just using a single age burst of star formation from BPASS. If you do uh, this, which lots of people do because you don't always have the great rest frame UV to actually measure those stars, you would just go through and say, oh, what age is my stellar population by what BPASS starburst works best, um, fits my emission lines best. So this is a way lots of people do this. Um, but what they're looking at for, what we're seeing is uh, these emission lines and then also uh, where they're galaxy would fall on these curves. The plots that I'm showing here have the log u or the ionization parameter on the x-axis and the line ratio on the y. Um, when we plot these things, you can see for the low ionization species like N2, they peak the models all peak on the left side because those are softer ionization parameters, um, radiation fields. Intermediate lines peak in the middle and then the high ionization species on the bottom all peak on the right, except for helium-2. It doesn't peak anywhere. So that's not a good sign for any of these models. <laughs> um, but when we add the um, galaxies as observations and points on these plots, you see that for the low and intermediate ionization lines, the models do a decent job of reproducing these uh, observations. And so uh, the models are color coded by metallicity, the points are on the same scale. Um, so they do an okay job. The points at least fall within the range that the models are capable of reproducing. The bottom line here with the high ionization species, not doing so hot. Um, all of these points start to fall above the model range that we have plotted here. Um, so for O3, it starts to fall a little bit above, but by helium two, those models don't peak anywhere. This doesn't make any sense. Um, so for the very high, and actually just for the high ionization lines, this really doesn't work. So we need to level up our modeling. And so to do that, we went to this level two version, and that's using that stellar continuum fit that we did, um, that I just showed you a, a couple slides ago. So here, instead of using BPASS for a single age burst of star formation, we use that stellar continuum fit as our input to Cloudy. And so these are very tailored uh, Cloudy runs. We've set the gas phase metallicity to what we've measured in the galaxy. And now we're setting the stellar population to what we've measured in the galaxy. When we do this, we would expect the, the stars that live there, if they're capable, 
uh, will reproduce the very high ionization lines. And we still don't see that. <laughs> um, so you see that for the low and intermediate ionization lines that BPAS had done just fine with, um, we're still reproducing those. So the black dashed line is that best fit metallicity run. You can see the point falls on that black line. We have a good agreement for our high ionization lines now um, with the O3 in the high zone in the middle. But for the very high ionization lines, that flux is nowhere to be found from these models. We're not able to produce high energy photons that would ionize helium-2 or uh, O4. So this still doesn't work. And so the stars are not capable of reproducing that high energy emission. So we're going to level up our modeling again, and we're just going to add a black body this time because we didn't know what it was. And we didn't want to be one of the groups that just picked something to try and explain it. Um, so we just added a black body to try and explore the parameter space for what might be sources that live in this galaxy. Because it's not the stars. The stars can't reproduce this. But if you add a black body, something higher temperature, you can actually reach this um, O4 and these helium-2 uh, emission line ratios. So you do need something in order to reproduce the high energy photons. The stars do doing just fine at reproducing everything from high, low, intermediate, high ionization, very high ionization, very high energy photons. You need an additional source. Question, Zoom? Yeah. Ask him. Casey, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I'm loving this. Um, I, Grace, the, if you, um, let me see if I can phrase my question intelligently. When you're doing the modeling of a continuum and the emission lines together, you're already accounting for variations in the abundances like alpha to iron, and that, I think that just makes the problem worse. Is that correct? Yes. So we have uh, set for our photoionization modeling, we change the abundances to match what we've measured in the galaxy. And so that was one of the great things about having both the optical and UV spectra. We had a better understanding of what those abundances look like. Um, and so we did match the gas phase properties to what we measured. Uh, so yeah, that is so cool. I really hope we can do this with James Webb. Go on. I'm sorry. I'll stop. Okay. I think it's great. We'll continue now. <laughs> um, but just to show again what I'm talking about, because I like this plot, um, without any additional source, the stars cannot reproduce the very high energy photons that are we see with helium-2 and oxygen-4. So the black body that we added has two parameters. There's a temperature component and a flux component. So we can change how hot this is and how much of the light of the galaxy is being produced by this, um, by this additional source. And so when we plot these different models on the same, uh, same line ratio plots we were looking at before, um, you can kind of see that the temperature is determined a little bit more by where the, the um, observations fall for intermediate lines um, based on just the shifting of these black bodies. And then the percentage component of the, like the flux is determined more by where the, um, this observation falls on the very high ionization lines. And when we go through and find the best fit black body that re for uh, reproducing our emission lines, we find that for both J10 and J14, you need an 80,000 Kelvin black body that produces 45% or 55% of the total light of the uh, galaxy. And by that, I mean, we integrated that stellar population and the black body. And so that combined integration of that, because we're not really doing anything with like the IR and dust. So it's not really a bolometric luminosity, but it's the bolometric luminosity of the information we had. But when we do that, that's a lot of black body to hide in a galaxy. <laughs> it's half of the light of the galaxy. And so our question really turns into, where are we missing solar astrophysics? What could this black body actually be? Um, and so here's a nice list of things that we have thought of and have been brought up for us uh, as I presented this in the past. But one of the main things um, that is a problem for all of this type of analysis is that the models that we're using are based off of low metallicity stars that uh, have low Z atmospheres that are just extrapolated. They're not based off of observations of low metallicity stars. They're based off of much higher metallicities that have been extrapolated down. Those are possible, those are wrong. 
um, and maybe they have more energy high in this higher uh, energy bent uh, part of the spectrum. There's also very massive stars, stars up to 300 solar masses. When we ran our models, we didn't see a huge impact of that changing the spectrum shape, um, but they have been suggested in the past. Stripped stars for if you're in binaries or wolf ray stars, if you've managed to strip your own cell as a, a massive star. Um, those are both options, which would be really good, but low metallicity versions are really hard to make work uh, because if you don't have optical emission lines, how do you blow off your envelope? Well, metal lines that would have actually tried that. Um, so it's hard to know if these sources would exist in uh, the galaxies we're looking at because they're so metal poor. There's also shocks um, as a possibility. And when we've looked at models that have um, run shock, even, uh, shocks as the source, they haven't um, been able to produce the emission lines that we're seeing. They are uh, not actually producing enough uh, of the, the light. And then there's finally high mass X-ray binaries, HMXVs, or ultra-luminous X-ray sources, which have been discussed a lot in the literature so far. Um, so we wanted to check whether or not uh, that would be the, the source for our galaxies. So we went actually to find whether or not there were X-rays. So we went and got Chandra observations of these two galaxies. Um, and what we found was one of them was not a detection and the other one had six photons. Um, so that's X-rays for you. Um, that is enough for us to say that the hardness ratio of those six photons is consistent with an HMXD. It's very exciting times. Um, and what this means is maybe it's high mass X-ray binaries. It's possible, but it's not going to be the, the answer for all of these, um, these galaxies because we can't even detect X-rays in half of them. Um, so we should have detected like 20 photons. That's what we were going for. And we got zero out of one and six out of the other. <laughs> so we're not really, it's not a, a hard uh, yes or a hard no for high mass X-ray binaries on these galaxies. Um, and that's just what I've written here is that the galaxies are very good at being analogs. They look a lot, a lot like what we expect. Um, and it might be a high mass X-ray binary depending on your galaxy. And that is really what we've seen with other people too. These are very case by case basis for ULXs or high mass X-ray binaries. They don't tend to act like a good consistent population, which is really, really annoying. Um, but so it might be that we have these, these additional sources. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to uh, keep trying to figure out of like with analogs, what is actually going on? We have the ability to study them in a lot more depth since they are nearby, um, but we still need to use all of the different wavelengths to actually maybe figure out what's going on. Um, and so that's what we've done so far. Uh, I'm going to bring up the possibility of extending this into the higher redshift universe. Um, so what I'm hoping to do here is to do this on a slightly um, higher redshift scale uh, using the templates program with Justin and doing this on more of a resolved uh, pixel by pixel basis for these lens galaxies. Uh, maybe we'll see what we can get out of Sears uh, for any galaxies that have enough data that we can really see what's going on with spectra here. Um, so those are the questions, the moving forward things I hope to be doing in the next few years. We will see what we can get to. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. I will actually just leave up the slides. If you've got anything else to add to this list, please let me know <laughs> where we're at. It's, it's a new hand. But I'm happy to I'm happy to yield the floor as well. Go for it. Casey, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. No, no, I, I love this mystery that you're trying to solve here. So I was staring, I was thinking, you know, what else, how else, what else, how else can you diagnose what's going on, right? Like, I love the x-ray stuff. And I was going to say six photons is a lot for a high redshift astronomer, but, you know, I, I see your point. Um, so if I look at this plot, is there any hope of getting that UV continuum detection that would tell you that you've got a much larger number of 600 yeah. angstrom photons? Um, and that's just well beyond what cost can do. That's sort of the first question. 
Um, then I have other ones. So why don't we start with that? That's a great question. And so that would be awesome if we could get a good just observation of what's happening where this black body has really boosted all of the emission from stars. Um, it's not really clear what exactly we could do to get that. Um, we are just basically looking into all windows of, well, all opportunities to narrow the window of where this black body is hiding. Um, and so I'm not really sure what I would do I need to push whatever UV I can possibly get that can get me a little bit farther. Um, so okay. still looking at yeah, that. Yeah, I, I know I'm just curious. I mean, certainly in high redshifts, we'll be stuck with the IGM starting to slap us silly above redshift of one, certainly. Um, and so then the next time I had to pull up Danielle's plot, that four eye innovation thing. What about like other lines? Like neon three is a pretty strong line, especially in these kind of high innovation things. And does that tell you anything? Do you have that from Sloan? Is it something you can get from LBC? Um, yeah. So we do have some neon. Um, we have neon three observations um, for these galaxies. Um, and they are some of the ones that help us determine what is going on in that high energy zone? So I think I have neon. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so we use neon in our our emission line uh, suite to figure out what was going on. Um, and then we also tested the neon five uh, because we have detection of neon five in one of these two galaxies. Um, so there again is that uh, there is high energy photons. But it's not clear that it is uh, like shocks, which you might expect with neon five or anything else. Um, and so right. we have been using that in our suites. It doesn't change a lot of what we're looking at when we try and do like best fit black bodies. No, this is a great plot because it shows you that neon three, you know, argon. What is that? Argon four. Like, and they're both kind of straddling into that high end ionization regime. So you know, there is a problem here. Um, and then I'm going to ask one more question about the solar population models. Um, I know you're using VPASS. I know you're using like these Starburst 99 models. Are there any constraints there? Well, one thing I was struck is this is probably like a single H2 region in the galaxy, like you were saying, right? There must be some kind of dynamical information, or maybe there's not, but there could be a dynamical information that tells you something about the age of the H2 region that you might be able to use to constrain it. Um, yeah. I was just struck that like the VPASS models are a little bit older in one case, which you might expect because they're supposed to have additional mixing for the binary right. in particular. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't, that's a, a question. I love your opinion on that, but I also know I'm taking up a lot of time. So I'll stop. Yeah, yeah, no, it, the, the, the information that we would get for like the expansion of, an H, of the H2 region would be helpful um, to just kind of help verify the ages we're getting from the solar populations. Um, and so we, I haven't looked at it yet, um, but we have basically just the emission line uh, equivalent with like the, the velocity spread for that gas to just try and help determine where it's coming from. Um, and so all we can say is that the helium two is definitely nebular. Um, so we don't have any other information that we've taken from it so far. Yeah, okay, no, that's excellent. So, thank you. I have a Actually, I was going to say a comment, but a yeah, I got a question. Um, first of all, I guess a comment on, on Casey's question. Uh, oh, was somebody in the room asking a question? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Go, you can go ahead, Rob. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't understand what was going on. The uh, on Casey's, I think you need a shell resolution. You you really want for kinematics of the ionized gas. You're dealing with a lot. That would be helpful to actually understand what's going on. Um, yeah, and we maybe have some, some H1 to see what else was going on in these galaxies, and we have not done anything with it yet. Let's look at it. Uh, yeah. Going great. <laughs> so my question, uh, you probably answered this because your uh, list of possible high ion Yeah. So under Wolf A stars, you probably explained Wait. it. Uh, the mod spectra must be good enough that you can really put some good constraints on, you know, Wolf A features of various kinds. Yeah. And you know, how far did you go to do that? True. We looked at the hold on, which direction are my spectra? 
Um, so we looked for Wolf Array features um, out of our optical spectra from MODS, and we did find there are some carbon-4 bumps um, that are features from Wolf Arrays. Um, they don't appear strong enough for us to believe that the Wolf Arrays are driving the high energy photons in these galaxies. Um, we did take a look. Um, and so although they are there, uh, they're not uh, enough of a source for this to be uh, driven by Wolf Arrays. Yeah, so you don't see those real strong, what, 5,900 uh, and something angstrom. Yeah, there are some classic anyway. features, yeah. Okay, good, thanks. We have some tiny ones, but not enough to be like, this is solidly Wolf Arrays. Right, right, exactly, yeah, thanks. Rob, this is our greatest, this is my ignorance. So the Wolf Rays are supposed to be strongest for certain metallicities, right? Like 20, 30% solar. Would you expect them to kind of be present here? I just, we, I don't remember. That's, yeah. So we don't really expect them at these low metallicities because they don't have the metals to drive off their envelopes well enough. Okay. Um, so that's actually so reassuring, I guess, um, at some level. Yeah. If they do exist, we don't know how to detect them because that's not, they don't have the lines to show that they exist there. Um, there's just right. not enough metals. We don't yeah, know how I mean, that would work. You wouldn't expect the the wind driven, the ones that are created by uh, wind driven mass loss. But I, I would think binary weird star binary star yeah. evolution of one kind or another might mm -hmm. you know be going on, and it might not be in B. Yeah, and that's been something that's also been explored. We've looked at like how stripping could help just strip that envelope off without the winds, that would um, probably require stellar populations that are older than we have um, to make that work efficiently. That's really interesting. So I guess the upshot is you just need something that looks like an 80,000 80, Kelvin black body or something to... Yep. No, okay, <laughs> Don't know what it is. Need something that would fill that slot. <laughs> Go back to Jen. Yeah, Jen, you had something to say? Yeah, um, so on one of your first slides, you had a you showed a summary of all of the uh, spectral features that you were using. Right. I just want to compliment you on actually acknowledging that those are things on the periodic table by <laughs> in their atomic number. That's very rare in galactic. <laughs> I just want to say I, as a stellar person, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, we have to kind of take all the things that people just like to use as lines and be like, no, wait, what does the star actually do in this case? I like this plot too. It's just like so. It's interesting to see them all laid out that way, you know. Yeah, I just have this above my desk at home, and, <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what is this line? What is the energy? What am I working with? Um, this has been really helpful. Danielle makes very nice infographic type things for the papers. I, I will completely agree. I I pull this plot up frequently and make other people do so too. So, so yeah. But I assume that Z, yeah, I thought that Z was just metallicity, Jen. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that. I was like, no, that's my Z, not yours. <laughs> I have a good way to put in order. And obviously, we just go back to what element it is. <laughs> Can I ask on your list of like random things that produce high energy photons, were any of those producing like non-thermal UV emission or is this all stuff that's like this could be an actual 80,000 80, black body or yeah. I'm like oh maybe this is like some narrow band UV emission or something. Mm -hmm. So honestly I think shocks is our best bet for it being something that is not an actual black body um, because we have lots of different shock models that we fit best here. Um, the ones that have been most used are the um, I don't know, um, Allen 2008, I think is the, the reference. Um, but there are also other models that we could use that are not like thermal equilibrium shock kind of things uh, that we should look at a little bit harder. But all shock information that we've tested so far, it doesn't give us anything that would work. It's just crazy to think that like there's an extra 50%. Yeah. I worry about that a lot. Because <laughs> how high is 50% of that? Yet? Emission. Yeah, I don't know. As a, you know, as, at the risk of sermonizing a little bit, I'll say this is how we learn, right? Like I remember there were some papers by Chuck Steidel half a decade ago that he did the same thing, right? He exhausted whatever solar population model he was using and then just added in a thermal component, right? Um, Lisa Keeley's done this too. I think with she's used white dwarf stars in the past and just scaled them up to 
look basically like black bodies, like, you know, yeah. yeah. So it's telling us there's something we don't know, which is really cool. So, yeah. so we don't know what's going on. And yeah, Nico, what's up? Um, for the one of these two objects has neon five. Yes. So if, if like these are like uh, the temperature of these black bodies are, are to get helium two carbon four, yeah. right? Wouldn't you have to jack it up even higher? To get yeah, hundred EV lines like Neon Five. You do. I don't remember where off the top of my head. Um, they're they still the best fits end up at eighty thousand Kelvin. But when you include Neon Five as a requirement for like, like, so when we include it, the best fit still ends up being an eighty thousand Kelvin. But if we just focus on the high energy lines, it, it boosts it to a hundred thousand. Um, it prefers a higher temperature black body, just Neon Five. That doesn't make sense for the rest of the galaxy. So, it's a great um, qualifying exam kind of question, Nico. So, like, you know, if you look at the reply <laughs> for helium two here, how much, how many photons are you making that could ionize neon four or something, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so I have done. Uh, I realize I haven't put the the referee report version that I fixed uh, up on the archive, but I did all of the like neon five plots as well. And there's yeah, the, the appendix of this paper as it will be once it's actually published. That's still happening. <laughs> Till I got here for me to be like, oh yeah, here's the machine readable tables. Let's get this in production. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> cool. uh, well, we are at the hour. So let's thank both our speakers again. If you want to come to lunch, uh, come. Thanks, everybody. Straight line for Arcula. The star forming main sequence has a high end turnover. And then we don't use the straight line.